It's a scheme involving human trafficking and health care fraud. Native Americans are being preyed upon. They're going up on the reservation, plucking people off the ground. We've heard from so many people, uh, tribal members, tribal leaders, who have said their family members have gone missing for months. Vanishing from parts of Arizona and several other states. They said they're going to give them a home, quote unquote, they never, we never see them again. Hidden away in sober living homes, popping up across the valley. Attorney General Mays is calling this a game of whack-a-mole. Billing the state for services rarely provided. In one case, we discovered that access had been billed for more than 13 hours a day for alcohol rehabilitation services to a four-year-old. Nearly a billion dollars of fraud made off the vulnerable. If your business is legitimate, can you just tell me a little bit more about your business? Now investigators are cracking down, but is it too late? Do you deny the allegations of Absolutely. offering services without proper clinical oversight or excessive billing? I have no further comments. For nearly a year, I've reported on the sober living scandal's transformation into a full-blown crisis. Desperate people struggling with addiction, picked up off the street and dropped in a home with, with drugs, alcohol, and no treatment available. This is the sober truth inside Arizona's Medicaid scandal. I'm Fox 10 investigative reporter Justin Lum. Imagine an elaborate scheme targeting vulnerable people, including Native Americans, fighting addictions. They're promised a path to sobriety, but instead they're enticed with alcohol, drugs, and even money, kept locked up in random homes while Arizona's Medicaid system is defrauded, costing you, the taxpayer. The problem is real, despite a crackdown, and it's costing people their lives. She was a wonderful mother to her three children. She helped her mom around the house. She was a, a family person. She was always there at our family gatherings, and Monica was, she had a big heart for everyone. Monica Antonio's story begins here on the San Carlos Reservation. Two hours east of Phoenix, loved ones still have questions while coping with her loss. Back in February, the 21-year-old wanted to be better for her kids, telling her family she wanted to quit drinking, choosing to go to rehab. I had asked my sister where she had went, and she said someone just came and picked her up one day in a van, and she left with them. It's what tribal leaders call white van syndrome. Native Americans picked up swiftly from different reservations, taken to the valley, mainly in vans, housed in fake rehab centers. Monica stayed at a sober living home in Phoenix near 91st Avenue and Indian School Road. After some time, she visited family for a weekend, having second thoughts. And she wanted to stay, but that phone call she got um, changed her mind. She told one of our relatives that she was being threatened that if she didn't go back with them, that they knew where she lived and they knew she had children and she had her mom, her family members that lived there that were gonna get hurt if she didn't go back. On March 27th, two weeks after that visit, Glendina Brown and family members rushed to Phoenix after getting a call. Monica was dead. According to the Phoenix Police Report, Monica and her roommate had been drinking at the neighborhood park the night before she died. The report says the roommate told police that he left the park hours before finding Monica unresponsive next to her bed later that morning. The rooms had mattress, um, twin size mattresses on the floor, like five or six in each room, and there was three bedrooms. And they were just all on the floor. There was no dressers, no... The, everything was on the floor, mattresses, blankets, pillows. Glendina went inside and says there was no food in the co-ed home she describes as a flop house. How did you fathom that she was living like that? I was hurt. I was really hurt. She was living like that. Well, I was here home in my own home with my children, sleeping good at night and not knowing that she was suffering and she was, you know, going through a lot more than what she left from. 
and it, I was hurt. I was broken when I saw what she went through. In an interview with Phoenix PD, the house manager said Monica showed up at the front door intoxicated around 1 in the morning with a can of alcohol. The manager also said he took the drink away before letting her in. The police report reveals that a couple months after Monica's death, a witness came forward and told PPD that Monica heavily used drugs and alcohol, but said the sober living home was negligent because protocol meant sending someone to a detox facility when alcohol or drug abuse was suspected. The Maricopa County Medical Examiner ruled the cause of death acute ethanol intoxication and the manner an accident. Her roommate also told police that Monica had recently found out she was pregnant after having an intimate relationship with a staff member per Phoenix PD. I knocked on the door of the home, but no one answered. Has Phoenix PD indicated that they will take another look at this case because from the last check it was closed? No. The investigator that um, gave us his information, I couldn't leave a message. They never answered their phone. Um, I called the police department numerous times. Um, nothing, no, no call back. I asked Phoenix police if the case could be reopened. The spokesperson says nothing in the report indicates it will be at this time. So on this street we have two, and this one is, is this one has been giving us a lot of problems. Lorena Gutierrez leads the community block watch in the neighborhood where Monica died. They would go inside those tunnels there that you see, passed out drunk, and we would find them, you know, in the morning. She routinely drives around documenting activity and says the situation was much worse last year. And she just approached you and asked you what? I mean, and she just says, hey, do you, uh, you know, do you want to get off the street? Do you want to? Some help. They switched to my boyfriend's insurance, and I don't know how. He's not native. I need help. This is not the first time we find you passed out <laughs> in our community. You know, we literally had people passing out and, I mean, drunk, passed out in our park, in our porches, in our front porches. We would just see activity that, like I said, was just, just not normal. There was a common thread between everyone she questioned. They would say, well, what's the first thing? Oh, they would, you know, they asked me for for my information, sign me up for access and, and food stamps. Before access began major reforms to its Medicaid system, there was a lack of oversight as fee-for-service providers billed the state increasingly over the last three fiscal years on one code alone, from $53.5 million in 2020 to $668 million in 2022. Non-Native Americans could enroll in the American Indian Health Plan just by signing up over the phone. That was until this past June. The previous loophole allowed fraudsters to not only target natives, but all vulnerable people in need of free housing. Providers also billed on behalf of other providers, upping the risk of fraud, but that's now restricted. I've been going through my photos a lot and, and I do see her every day. Glendina says she found this blank sign-in sheet at the home labeled Artemis of Arizona. We learned Artemis is a behavioral health provider and its clinic is licensed by the Department of Health but as for the house where Monica was found, DHS confirms that property is not licensed for treating patients. I reached Dr. Neelish Patel, who is the co-owner of Artemis. He declined an interview, but told me over the phone that the program is still operating from the same sober living home, despite not being paid by access. Artemis of Arizona was suspended back in May, one of dozens of providers accused of fraudulently billing the state's Medicaid system. We went to the clinic to find a notice saying Artemis is now locked out for not paying rent. The property manager told me these suites have been empty for a while. A crackdown Glendina wishes happened sooner. I was happy that they were finally getting down to the bottom of it, but a big part of me was hurt. I was mad, I was sad, and I wished that something was done sooner. Another face of the sober living crisis. I want to know how people like Monica are recruited. Inside the sober living scheme is an X factor, recruiting, which leads to patient brokering, all to get paid in kickbacks according to the FBI. We've exposed the alleged bad actors in behavioral health, but this time I sat down with the former recruiter. Um, 
Holy Ann Shorthair was one small piece of the puzzle. He thought he was helping his people, but admits money was the motive. What does it take to be a recruiter for sober living homes? You just really got to get on their level and then uh, try to persuade them uh, about you know the dangers of the street. He says he used to recruit for a behavioral health provider that is now suspended by access, paid under the table to find at-risk Native Americans across the valley in need of housing and food. 19th Avenue, uh, Camelback and uh, 19th Avenue and uh, Northern, Mesa, uh, Dobson, uh, in that vicinity, Santan Valley, uh, the Chavez Park, uh, the Indian School Park, 47th Avenue is the avenues, you know, Thomas all the way up to Indian School, um, Bethany Home, I mean, they're everywhere. Holy Ann was usually on foot, staying close to light rail stations to find targets, taking their information, to help get them signed up for access insurance, and some flew into Arizona from reservations out of state. I, I brought people from North Dakota, Minnesota, Alaska, and it was pretty easy, you know, uh, just to get them in. You know, it was just a quick call, Uber would pick us up and then uh, uh, drop us off directly at the house. How many clients do you think you recruited? Uh, uh, wow, 100. A little over 100, give or take. Julian tells me he was paid 100 bucks for every person he recruited to the program, consistently making 12 to $1,300 a week. Eventually when I found out that, you know, uh, how much each individual is worth, you know, I was basically getting peanuts. He's right. Up until May 2023, Access paid out 58% of billed amounts to providers under a code known as H0015. This code is meant for intensive outpatient treatment centers for substance abuse disorders. Today, the rate is set at about $158 for one unit of service, and the code can be billed just once a day. Now a less lucrative option, but as Holy Ann tells me, legitimate services never seem to be provided. He says clients were allowed to drink alcohol, abuse drugs, and some even overdosed. Something seemed off. And I started questioning, and that's when, you know, the money uh, was coming in a little more, you know, just to keep my mouth shut. But seeing my people um, dying from alcohol-related deaths under their care is when I really started questioning. Do you feel guilt or regret? I really do. Um, I feel bad for the, for the for the loss, you know, of you know those people who their loved ones, you know, they they, they lost, you know, their loved ones, and uh, I feel bad because uh, I promised them, you know, uh, hope. I promised them shelter. I promised them a change, and I failed them. Holian is not proud of the part he played but hopes his story can help others avoid red flags. Being sober is so beautiful. You know, the, the, the more you distance yourself from negativity, the more beautiful things happen. And if my people can understand how important life is, you know, and, and just try getting on this side for a little while. With the state weeding out bad actors and less money for fraudsters to make, what happens to victims of the scam? And where do they end up? In January of 2023, a new Arizona governor and attorney general were sworn in. The state's Medicaid agency also got a new director. Those leaders blamed the previous administration for allowing hundreds of millions of dollars to be stolen from the state. Now, nearly a year later, more than 300 behavioral health providers are suspended by access over allegations of Medicaid fraud. But as sober living homes shut down, people are left out on the streets. Stolen people, stolen benefits, named after the issue plaguing the Native American population. This group is on a mission. And then we'll stop there, feed as many people as we can, and then go up to 19th and Bethany, right? Yeah. This night is like many others, trying to find relatives kicked out of shady sober living homes. What happens is they just get shuffled around, and lately we just see new people, yeah. all new people never, never talked to before. Yeah, so there's, there, it seems like there's a whole new crowd. Yeah, there's a lot more houses being closed, so that's why everybody that are now in the houses that are closing down, 
They're just mm -hmm. letting them all out into the streets. Reva Stewart has seen people recruited outside the Phoenix Indian Medical Center at bus stops and on streets across the city. If you go out as often as we do, you get to know them. And unfortunately, there have been a lot of new Your son was stabbed. unsheltered relatives, a lot of younger ones that don't know us, that ask what we're doing, ask if we're a sober living home. You know, because they, are, they get thrown out of one, they want to go to another one. The team makes stops near light rail stations, giving away meals and care packages to those in need. Outreach sparks conversation. Where are you from? I'm Wonder Up. What are you doing down here? Were you in a sober living home? No, I was, and then um, I passed away, so after that, I don't have no family. You know, I'm stuck out here, so I don't have no family back home or anywhere. We meet Wesley Nelson. He's from Pinon, Arizona in Navajo Nation. Wesley tells me he was recruited to a sober living home in Mesa, but at some point residents were told to leave. Were allowed to drink or do drugs? Yeah. They didn't really well, they supervise. Really, they didn't really supervise them. The next bus I can get him on is at 8.50 in the morning. Okay. Do you think you can get there yeah. by 8? If you can get there by 7.30 or 8, before, between 7.30 and 8, I'll get you the bus ticket and I will get you to the bus station. Now I want to go home and just get my life straight, you know. Because I've been I've gone through a lot here, you know. Yeah. Just streaking, smoking, and trying to do right for myself too, you know. What's different compared to last year? The difference is you see a lot more unsheltered relatives and um, now they're admitting that they were in a sober living home. How many sober living homes? They don't know. They don't even know the names. They don't know the names. They don't know which clinic they went to or if they were ever in a clinic. It was commonly New Mexico, now Montana, Alaska, where else? South Dakota, Oklahoma, North Dakota. Um, we have Florida and Nevada. We had some from um, Minnesota. This is one of the most, one of the biggest scandals in the history of the state of Arizona when it comes to our government. The influx of Native Americans from reservations across the country end up right here. Arizona's Attorney General's office is investigating a pattern of unlicensed sober living homes throughout the Phoenix metro area. The scheme offers free medical care, food and housing as long as patients are members of Access. This way, they can be brokered to behavioral health outpatient programs using their access IDs to charge the state's Medicaid agency. Court documents say one alleged broker told investigators he made $40,000 from one outpatient facility in two months for the patients he brought in. Sometimes you'll see recruiters and they will tell you that. The relatives will tell you there's recruiters here. And how does that look like? They're walking around just talking to them or driving by? And driving by and asking if they want to go to a sober living home. So my guess is when you have new people and you don't see the other ones that we've seen, did they go to a sober living home? And that did, must be enticing to someone who needs help, who's not sober, has no money, no food, and they just want to lay their head down. Yes. But like Wesley tells us, these homes are often unmanaged and unsupervised, enabling drug and alcohol abuse. Raquel Moody lived through the experience herself, bouncing from sober house to sober house, where she says no one was really sober. The 10 houses, 10, 11 houses that I've been to, it was just the house manager just didn't care. The head guy had put his hands on me. Another house that, you know, none of the staff are trained in this field to be professionals for peer support. All they're trained is to save money and make money. That's it. We arrive at 51st Avenue and Baseline in Levine. This area has become a hotspot for unwanted activity, not far from construction of new housing. How many of these people do you think came from sober living homes? At least 90% of them came from sober living homes. What is your um, drug of choice? Uh, alcohol. Alcohol? When did you last drink? When did you last drink? Like, like an hour ago. 
It may take several contacts for advocates like Jerry Long to get someone to accept services. So I'm going to set up his aftercare at a legitimate facility. One step to sobriety, but also a step away from recruiters and fraudsters. We had a lot of people ask for help. We were able to get one home tomorrow and we have another one going into detox. Sometimes home is more than a thousand miles away. Leah Oldman Chief says she was staying at a sober living home in Tucson, ready to leave. Well, practically they were holding me against my will because they were bribing me with money, telling me that they would give me alcohol or as long as they didn't see it. Jerry takes her to the airport so she can fly home to Blackfeet Nation in Montana. The crisis has clearly spread outside of Arizona and I want to know if there's a city with a grasp on the problem. While state agencies work to crack down on sober living fraud, many cities in Arizona have been impacted by the scam in the form of unlicensed sober living homes. But as we learned, the city of Surprise tackled the issue before it got out of hand. So this has created a very dangerous situation uh, for me and my family. They operate for six months to get an investigation. They shut down open up a different, sign up for a different LLC and pop up in another house three blocks down. He was so high, he literally couldn't walk from you to me straight. I'm in fear of my life. They're doing profit sharing with treatment centers where they're saying that they're going there, fraudulently documenting that they're receiving substance abuse services. Wow. And then cost sharing for the offsetting for the sober living. A month before Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs announced a statewide crackdown on fake rehab centers and Medicaid fraud, the city of Surprise knew there was a problem. Several residents voiced concerns to officials about unlicensed sober living homes in their neighborhoods. That's when we finally put all the pieces together. When people started showing up at the meetings for our city of surprise and other people were coming forward with information that's when we put it together that that's what this house was about lynette irisabal lives in bell west ranch near bell road and state route 303. she says earlier this year she started seeing strange activity outside there was people coming and going there was no supervision she describes seeing drug use, garbage on the street, and transients pushing shopping carts. Anthony Johnson is another resident who witnessed the same. People are staggering around the neighborhood, falling down. It was, it was some, some of the erratic behavior we saw. It just wasn't uh, common in our, our community. I would say pretty early into my term, uh, mid to late January, uh, I had a resident reach out earlier just inquiring about sober living homes. And at that time, we really weren't sure what exactly was going on. Councilman Nick Haney would find out soon enough. The city did its research learning a sober living home could profit $180,000 annually off of one person on the American Indian Health Plan. Data from March 2023 reveals there were 40 known sober living homes in Surprise, but not licensed with the city or state. No licensing through DHS means no oversight, and city officials say that leads to unsafe conditions for people in recovery while bringing blight and crime into neighborhoods. Calls for service to surprise police spiked in March. I was angry initially, and that anger turned into me being fired up because I was in a position to do something about it. I think what we came to understand is that um, this issue had popped up in our city, and there's not a lot we can do to proactively um, prevent it. Director of Community Development Tiffany Kopp also spoke to Fox 10 earlier this year as she worked to find solutions, aware of an unlicensed sober living home located near Lynette and Anthony at the time. So what has Surprise done to tackle the sober living issue? Council adopted a short-term rental ordinance that prohibits those type of properties to be used as sober living homes. There's also a group home licensing process that requires annual inspections and renewal fees. Violating business licensing requirements, the short-term rental ordinance or zoning laws can lead to a direct citation issued by code enforcement. The city's goal is to respond to a complaint on an unlicensed sober living home in less than 48 hours. An inspection is done, and once the allegation is confirmed, a criminal citation is issued to the business owner with a date in city court, as well as a notice of violation. 
The window to getting compliance is 15 days. And that's just us going to the home and saying, we see that you're here, we see that you don't have your DHS license or your city license, you're not meeting our zoning requirements. Here's your, your civil citation to go to court and, and explain why that is. From January through mid-August 2023, code enforcement has investigated nearly 140 complaints of unlawful sober living homes, closing 111 cases. Many of these homes voluntarily shut down and move on. We've had some point blank tell us then we're, we're moving to the, the neighboring jurisdiction. Um, or that's okay, we'll close this house, we have other houses elsewhere. That intel is communicated to the next city. For residents like Anthony, the sober living problem is resolved for now. We're back to quietness and we and my kids know that and they're, they're okay with riding in front of the home again. The neighbors are out more talking, so things are different now. So will the crisis get worse before things actually get better? How long will it take for the state to be drained of fraudulent rehab centers and shady sober living homes? Will major changes to the access billing system deter bad actors long term? Just some of the questions we're trying to find answers for. Thank you for watching The Sober Truth. For Fox 10 Investigates, I'm Justin Lump.